Hey everybody, welcome to this talk on painless multi-cloud to the edge powered by NATs and Kubernetes. This is going to be a code-driven talk. I'm going to take the first part. I'm going to give you the thousand-foot drop of NATs, and then my colleague will take you through all of the interesting things. So I'm the dumb guy doing the warm-up, and then, yep. Oh. Thank you, Nigel. <laughs> yeah, so I'm the dumb guy. I'm going to do the thousand-foot drop on NATs. Um, I'm going to just do some, I'm going to give you some warnings. There's going to be some audience participation. Nothing too embarrassing. There might be the odd arm raise here and there. And we've got a demo app, which I expect some of you will want to get your phone out. There's a bit of a bribe. We've got an awesome prize to give away for one of you lucky winners. So, uh, and there's another ask as well. You need to put a name in. So if you are British or, uh, I don't know, a little bit brave, if you don't want to put anything rude in, put a number in. Because the last thing I want to do is say, hey, such and such, you've won a prize. <laughs> it's happened this week. Um, so just remember, we're on video. It's being recorded. Right, OK. <laughs> so I'm David G. I'm part of the solution engineering team for Synadia. This is Tomasz Pietrzyk. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah, close enough. It's good enough. OK. <laughs> we both work for Synadia. Um, I'd say we're in the Nats team, but the whole company's kind of the Nats team. So Synadia, uh, Synadia's CEO is Derek Collison. He's the creator of Nats. So back in 2010, he created it and then rewrote it in Go in 2013. So we've got the absolute luxury of working with some of the best brains in this uh, kind of area. And NATS is one of those technologies where if you ask somebody, do you know NATS? They go, yeah, we know NATS. And it's kind of like going to like one of those all-you-can-eat world buffet restaurants where you've got 40 or 50 different cuisines. And if it's like me with my you know, chiseled figure, I go straight for the Chinese noodles. I love them. And go, hey, did you go to the restaurant? You go, yeah, I ate the Chinese food. What about the Korean? What about the vegetarian? So you have a main dish, and you take small spoons of other main dishes, and you put them on one plate. And Nats is kind of like that. Hey, do you know Nats? Yeah, we use it for request reply. Hey, we use it for pub sub. And it's not that Nats doesn't do any of that poorly. I think it's just that us humans have got this kind of mental state to pick something for one job and then tie other things together to, to build a full architecture. And what I want to do is leave you with a sense of simple. So when you leave this room today, instead of just thinking about it in one way, you'll think about building things very, very simply with fewer components rather than more. Again, I've asked uh, about using sensible names. So what we've got, if you're interested in doing this, please grab your phone, scan the QR code, or go to this app here. It's really simple. We don't capture anything dodgy. The source code, you can read it later if you're really worried about it. Please put a sensible name in. Again, I don't want to be offending anybody or upsetting anybody because I'm the kind of person that will just call it out. So you've been warned. And don't worry, if you don't catch this, the next slide has also got the link as well. What I'll do, I'm just going to do this. This is what I love about conferences. You lose the ability to type. It's amazing. How familiar are you with Nats? Well, let's do this. I'm a complete newbie. I've been with Synadia for four months, so I'm still learning some of this stuff. Um, all right. And what you should see is a graph. And this is actually a WebSocket-driven web application using Nats in the background. We're using the demo NAT system to collect all this data. And then I've got a local server running on my machine as well. So I'll collect some of the, the answers to the questions. And then later on, I'll show you some of the things we can do. But this is, this is all live. It's hosted on Vercel. It's very, very lightweight. Right, I'll get back to the talk. OK, so we've got a saying. There is a NATS for that. And as I opened up with, is it a messaging system? Is it a broker system? Is it a connective data substrate? It's all of those things. So NATS has got this ability to deal with request reply semantics and pub sub. We've got the persistence layer, which we can just turn on on the same binary. Once you compile it, it's about 17 megabytes, give or take. So we can do streaming. We can do key value. We can do object store. And then we can build these really, really complex topologies. But if there's one takeaway, NATS is a phone system for applications and for software and for microservices. The idea is that we can have these named conversations between one or more machines. Robots can pick them up, have a, a lovely conversation, and without persistence, when the conversation is over, the data is gone. But then we can turn persistence on, and then we can use it for caching. We can use it for deploying objects on the same system. We can replay those conversations. And because it's really, really simple, we get a lot of different ways you can use it. I think this is the big problem. I opened up with the weird noodle analogy. It's really, really powerful. And I think that's one of its biggest downfalls, and it's well worth explaining. So you think, OK, if Nats can do all these things, where do we go? How do I get started? Well, we've got 11 official client libraries. And that's got very wide to almost full coverage. Yeah. Yeah. 30 plus community contributed libraries as well. So if there is a language, 
chances are we've got coverage. If there isn't, again, it's open source. So if there's something that it, that's missing, feel free to either raise an issue or uh, do a PR. So if that's how to get started, so when we talk about client, you take your code, you glue a client library to that, and then we can talk NATS. Now, let's talk topologies. I've been to a few demos this week, and I'm sure you all have, and I've not really seen the word simple used very much. Every stand you go on to, it's kind of like, hey, we're going to take this centralized thing, and it's going to deploy this, and this, and this. And look, it's magic, and we get this lovely graph. And most of it's management plane or control plane semantics. So you have to hope that it's interpreting a DSL the right way and then giving you the right data back. And think, ah, oh, I've been here before. This is reminiscent of a, of a few other problems. So with NATS, we've got this lovely idea of simple. So you can take one NATS binary, give it some configuration. You could deploy three of them in a region to get a cluster. That's kind of nice. They gossip to each other as well. So that means when we get a client and it connects up to NATS, we only have to tell it where to go for one of the servers. And as soon as it's connected, all the other servers go, hey, we've got all these other gateways as well. So we get all this lovely kind of simplicity. Now we can turn on um, TLS, so we can encrypt the TCP sessions between the client and NATS. DNS is much simpler. We only need to have a few DNS entries actually for the, for the core servers themselves because clients effectively call home. And then we end up in this position where a client can then start an unsolicited bi-directional communication with something else, which perfectly serves this, this kind of microservices approach. And you might find it a little bit odd on the right-hand side where I've got an ISP called out. How many of you have been roaming and you've gone to like a campsite and you think, man, this connectivity is really quite terrible. You're losing these sessions and everything else. I think probably a fair few of you. I spent a long time in networking and uh, the amount of multi-layer NAT systems, not NATs, but NAT, not to confuse everybody, some network address uh, prevention, you know, IP starvation uh, technologies. So you end up in several layers of private addressing before you even get out to the edge. So when we start talking about IoT or the, you know, the pervasive edge, like a connected floodlight, how are you going to turn that thing on and off from a cloud? The cloud can't call in. This thing has to call out. So the whole thing, uh, what we used to do is do things like firewall punch through. That's not going to work. The ISPs can only hold so much state. And even in this scenario, NATs absolutely shine. So even cheap connectivity. I was going to mock the, the, the conference Wi-Fi, but I'll be honest, it's, pr it's been pretty good. Um, so if we can connect easily and we can build these powerful topologies, we put the clients in the code. The next step then is, well, now we go into operations. This sounds really, really complicated. What do we do? Well, NATS comes with the, the notion of batteries included. We can pull a tremendous amount of data out of the NATS servers. So we can pull it from a management tier perspective. And I'll just give you a bit of a, an example here. You know what I've done? We're in presenter mode, right? So I'm just going to jump out of here. All these tabs that you can see here, this is live coming off the demo system. So there's, there's no trickery, like we can go through, I'll just keep refreshing the tabs. We can put all this onto a control panel where you can build a nice UI. You can see what's connected, how it's connected. We absolutely hide nothing. So you can build all of these lovely graphics. Whether you use Prometheus, you can turn Prometheus on for NATS. You can build um, or use a Grafana dashboard if, if that's a tool of choice. Or like the, the screenshot on the right hand side, you can build something yourself maybe. You can take all of that data and give yourself some custom views. Um, so you, sometimes you wonder how things communicate with each other. How well are they doing? NATS has got this ability to load balance, so you can see how things are clustered together. Well, imagine uh, a cluster between the US and the, uh, and the EU. You might have services deployed in both, but actually what you want is you want the nearest service to respond to a request. NATS can do that out of the box, no load balance required, and then, but you might want to see how that's doing, and we, uh, we provide enough data for you to do that. So we think, okay, this is kind of interesting. We can... Um, simply deploy very, very complex communicating systems, and we can give them persistency. But experience in operations, every time we get a new problem, what do we do? We go, ah, new problem. I'll throw a new system and new service at that. So the operations team have got something new to learn. The design team has got something new to learn. Security has got something new to learn. It stacks. And I'm going to be very careful with words here. But we get this effect of compound interest. We can reduce the number of components that NATs can otherwise cater for. And again, this isn't a case of the noodles are great and the chips are crap. This is NATs can do all of these things really, really well. Um, and if you don't trust me, just, just take it for a test drive. And we've also, we've got, we've got documentation we can share with you. It really genuinely costs less to run NATs. Um, so as we progress this, this story and the current trends, so we're here at, at KubeCon, microservices are still the, you know, the kind of burning rage so we've now built in this thing called the services API into some of the client code. So the idea is you can build some very, very simple services with some callbacks. 
you tell it what subjects to work with, you give it a schema. So you can have a request and a response schema. So the system actually validates the payloads as they go out and as they come back in. And this isn't on the, the core server. This is right in the, the client code as well. So we end up with, I think that's, that's readable. Would you agree that's readable? I've not actually stripped out much from this. This is, this is pretty much off a live demo. Um, Self-documenting is always a bit of a sin. I'm not really going to say that. I'm just, I'm just going to reference it. I'd say we can read this, and any developer coming along can go, hey, we know what these things are do. So this is integrated into the, into the NATS clients. It will be in the NATS tooling. It is an experimental preview, but Jeremy on our team has got videos on this as well. So simplicity meets microservices, ease of connectivity, ease of operations. So then how does this look like in a kind of Kubernetes landscape? Well, I think we have, like all good things, it depends, you know, with sufficient thrust, you can make a pig fly. Not that you'd want to see the end result of that. But we've got numerous options for architectures. So we could have pods where the containers call out to a centralized NATS cluster. Or we can take the very same 17 megabyte binary, put that in the, uh, the pod, and have everything talk east to west through NATS and have that one NATS server call out with TLS back to a cluster. Ease of networking, dare I say, um, having been in networking for a good decade or so, working for vendors selling complicated network overlays, you don't really need a network overlay. We can get NATs to do all the transport. We can collapse the control plane and the data plane into one system. So yes, you're going to have some ingress points, um, but the rest of the communication stack can be very, very easy to run. Right, I'm not going to hand over just yet. What I'm going to do, I'm going to flick over to see the kind of data that's come back in. Um, hopefully, you've all give it your best. You put a name in, and let's see what's going to happen here. Right, so. First thing I'm going to do, let's see how many of you have ignored the advice and put a stupid name in. Is it going to time out before we get them? Oh, OK. That's not very many names. Ah, whatever. All right, I'm, I'm pretty pleased that there's no weird ASCII uh, phallus symbols, which is always a bit of a relief. Um, I did mention that there is this notion of load balancing built into NATS as well. So everybody right now that's got your phone open, that you're viewing the app. Just make sure that you've got a live page running. And this will be a tester, because if your name comes up, this will be great. Right, hopefully what you're going to see, and I just need to make sure this is not me. If it's me, it's not a fix, I absolutely promise. Pascal, where's Pascal? Right, I remember you said I've got a prize for you. You're going to take home. I need some, like, game show. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, Pascal. <laughs> Brace yourselves, he's going to take home some socks. You see what you missed out on? <laughs> yeah, I thought you'd say that. OK. Um, but the other thing is, because, again, um, I've gone, we, we just don't have enough time to do like any of this, any kind of justice like whatsoever. However, um, you can use WebSockets to communicate with NATS. You can go um, east to west. You can embed NATS in your applications directly. You can stand up really severely interesting architectures like stateless backbones and stateful edges. And it's. <laughs> It's dynamic in the terms of you don't need a lot of IAC to do these things. You deploy very simple components, you deploy very simple state, and you can build some incredibly powerful things. Um, a lot of this functionality and a lot of these features you can play with yourselves. So we've got a great website, which is natsbyexample.com. And if you now look at your screen, I've just sent you there through the app. So I'll leave you with how to get started, the examples. Um, hopefully, this bit has gone actually way quicker than I thought it would go. So either I'm talking really fast or time is doing this weird kind of relativity and it's bending. I'm not really sure what's going on. Um, have we got any questions? So I'm here to help, here to answer things. Any questions, any grumbles? You're going to get your socks in a minute? <laughs> 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 Unless it was a different question. I got like, wait a second. Um, when we are trying to achieve uh, something like an um, active-passive cluster. So we have a customer uh, who has an active cluster and a passive cluster. He has no storage uh, shared, so it's a pain. And um, when I'm trying to uh, achieve this with my microservice, so I uh, can send in my actual actu active cluster uh, stuff into the um, NUTS um, messaging, Mm -hmm. And 
Um, I hopefully the cl passive cluster is actually up and not <laughs> yeah. re recreated. Um, is it possible that when the cluster is uh, 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 switching a uh, failing over? So because they, ha they have an automatic failover without doesn't matter. And <laughs> um, is it uh, keeping uh, up and uh, connecting to the other cluster um, even when the the um, local nuts on this other cluster is currently not available? So I have my applications mm -hmm. on both clusters and not both uh, nuts clusters are up. Mm -hmm. So because I saw it on the slide with a, uh, yeah. a, a line, but with a grayed outline. Yeah, so I think this is fairly nuanced. So I think, can I rephrase the question? So if we take a scenario, and you need to confirm this for me, if we have two clusters, so we've got cluster A, cluster B, well, I can do it way around, obviously, depending on you're looking at me. Um, does the client connect to both simultaneously, or will it try and connect to both? Uh, or do you just connect to one? There's a load balancer in front of it. Interesting. So I've not come across yet any scenarios where active passive is in play because what typically we do is everything just stands up and works. In that scenario, uh, you know what? Maybe we talk about this afterwards. It's a, it's a really good question. I'd, I'd love to know the, the psychology behind the active standby, whether it's enterprise design that's kind of like bit us all on the behind. <laughs> Maybe we talk. I'll deliver your socks and make another chat. But in essence, so um, flicking this round, don't do that. Keep it all active, active. You can run dev and prod on the same system unless you're wanting to uh, exercise operations, in which case you can literally stand up like a global cluster on your laptop. It, it's quite impressive and you can play with all the semantics. In your case, uh, you could probably do TCP checks against the endpoint. If the system's up, then balance to it. If not, then don't. But I think you're probably causing yourself many headaches by going down that path. But it's a great question. Anybody else? Wow, see Lance. OK, in that case then. Oh. Over to you. Thank you. Tomash, <laughs> enjoy. OK, so uh, n now we will go to the part when we'll discuss what have changed in more or less last year uh, sim uh, since the Valencia KubeCon, uh, and especially last uh, 2.10 release. As I've seen uh, in the app, uh, many of you, which is also really great to see, are new to NATS, and because of that, most of those features we, we, sh we show here are kind of advanced uh, for, for advanced use cases. So we'll try to um, introduce them a little. Mm. And we'll start with out callouts. Uh, and before I go there, I think that's one thing to just refer what you said about the noodles, that people get in and then just want only this part or only that thing. Uh, because of how Nats is flexible and unopinionated, I think you could say, there are so many ways, and we can see that in this question, we didn't have a definite answer for that because there are so many ways you can uh, configure and create your topologies, your clusters, your configs, that it's very hard to give just sometimes more than one answer how you can do it well. Uh, and because of that, there are also people who are not coming for noodles or pineapple salad or pizza. Then one day will show up somebody at this Italian restaurant for pineapple pizza. And some of, the <laughs> some of the things that are into the 10, I think most of them are actually about increasing the flexibility, uh, going out to our users and customers uh, with their needs that we didn't even thought about many times, that we can, we can do better and we can, we can extend the flexibility of the system to make it even more uh, adaptable to many use cases. And off cloud is a great example of that. NATS has many ways you can uh, do uh, ALF into it. In the centralized model, in centralized model, via configs, via JOTs, via NKIS, bunch of them. But still, there was a need, especially by the corporate users or big production implementations of NATS, when there was a need to be able to hook in into some other uh, out provider, identity provider, or to do some stuff which basically means having custom code that handles the process. And that's what all callouts are. They allow to, uh, to either hook into some, uh, some other uh, system or to do a custom logic that, that is not part of the NAS server uh, flow. And how it works, uh, as, as we do a lot in NAS, uh, 
almost all the features in NATS are built on top of the core NATS. So the po uh, core pops up request reply, which request reply is also a pops up to be fair, and we build the jet stream on top of it, and on top of that is built key value. And the off callout is an example of that again. It's not like some separate system or anything like this. It's part of the NATS and it's using NATS internally to provide, we'll not get into technical details, but to provide a way to very easily um, create a separate service uh, that will hook into the NAT system and listen on some subjects and reply on them and do whatever there is need to be done. And the server will pass uh, everything it knows about the client. So all the certificates, uh, all the passwords, all that you, that you request will be there. It can be, of course, encrypted uh, if that's the need. And that allows for various ways that you can extend, change, alter, hook into the like, I don't know, Google out or whatever, whatever you want to do. And it, I, I think it solves uh, the remaining chunk of the, of the, of the um, scenarios for out that user has. Uh, <clears throat> next one, uh, this one is pretty advanced. So there is a subject mapping, NATS is subject uh, routing based. So you can, uh, when you have a subject, which is what normally in some other messaging system is called topic, uh, you can have wildcards when you subscribe to things, different kind of wildcards. But we, d we then push it further and we added subject mapping. So as you see on the right, when you have a subject and you publish to like events one, two, you can have a config in the server that will do whatever you need with those tokens. So it can revert them, it can compile them, it can create partitions out of them, uh, deterministic partitions, and a bunch of other stuff. And that was very useful and powerful, but it was server-based configuration. And most of the use cases were based on Jetstream, so our persistence layer built on top of Coronats. And this is the thing. Uh, the thing is that now when you create a stream, and stream is uh, the thing on the server that that uh, listens on the number of subjects and persists them uh, in, in order and allows you to fetch them via consumers. And now with this 2.10 release, uh, you will be able to configure those mappings per actually stream, not per server. And to give you an, an, a concrete example how it could work is, imagine that uh, any, any of you works in the IoT industry no, I, bad example. Then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but okay. That's. I think that's anyway a very um, easy way to grasp it. Imagine you have two because of NAS topologies, which can be very you know different with all with leaf nodes or clusters and all of that. It 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 acts really well with the edge. But there are cases where. There might be a hub in the cloud, for example, a big Kubernetes cluster that's running huge workloads of analytics. And then you would like to mm, ingest, the source the data from all the factories. Uh, and you don't want to have a hassle that each factory has unique subjects and unique names of things. Everyone is a single, the same uh, configuration for simplicity. And thanks to the subject mapping, now you can have a factory one, factory two. They both have uh, messages and data on, let's say, events and signal subjects. And inside this aggregate, when you're sourcing the data from the streams in the factories, you now can uh, remap them. So despite that factory one has events and factory two has events, now on this aggregated thing, you can have factory one stream, factory two stream, uh, so we can differentiate them really easily. Mm, and that's very powerful. Uh, there's also uh, another, another thing you can do uh, is that, that you can kind of closer to the normal subject mapping is that you can, if you want to, you can map the subjects while this, the, the stream is ingesting the data. You can now uh, do the mapping there too. You can also do the uh, partitioning. Uh, as you see here in the configuration, uh, the, uh, the, the, there's a partition uh, uh, function used, which uh, I will not get into the details maybe this time, but if you're interested, reach us out afterwards. We're very happy to discuss those. Mm. 
Next thing is multiple filter consumers. Uh, any of you guys using NATS use Jetstream? Okay, nice. So in Jetstream, there's, there are streams. So this is what stores the data. Uh, and there are consumers, which are server side construct, which what it does, it allows you to fetch the data from the stream and keep tracks where you are on the stream. Uh, though there was always a thing that consumer can have only one subject it listens to, mm, one filter subject. So it could ingest the whole stream or it can uh, ingest one subject. It can have wildcards and all that stuff. But if you have multiple subjects or you want to say only two of those in the wildcard, not all of them, you basically had to either, as you see on the left, <laughs> it's the same left as on you, uh, you have to ingest everything and on the client side filter things out, which is not very clean and not very efficient. Or you can have to create multiple consumers, which is not very clean code, easy to maintain because it multiplicates the instances of things you have in your application. So it, even it's simpler than image, as you can see now, the field, the, each, each consumer can have multiple filters, as many as you like to. And that allows you to have either this use case, when we have, again, the factories, and if you are interested in mm, not all of the, the data from all the factories, but just, let's say, A and B, you can filter them out only those two. So you're saving your throughput, your less train on server, a lot of good, good things happening there. There's also another use, use case. You could have, a st streams could have multiple subjects in itself. And in this case, stream could contain uh, data from few domains or f whatever entities you have. And you still would have to, if you want, were interested in this example, cars, planes, uh, boats, you could, <laughs> you could, you could uh, if you wanted to pick only planes and only cars, you would have to create two consumers that would independently fetch the data. Mm, and if it was only if out of the need to get only two of them, not all of them, you would intend then to merge those streams and, and, it, and it was not very clean and easy to use. And you were also losing ordering there. And now what you can do is just specify more uh, filters on the consumer and seamlessly you just get those planes and cars in this case. Uh, it's, it's much simpler on the, on the configuration side and it's also much more performant, and not maybe much more performant, but it's, it's, it's easier and better to use um, on, on the client side, and it's better for the server in many cases. So that also retains the order, because if you have two consumers and each of them is fetching on, the, on their own manner, you still know what's the order. Each of them has their order, but when you merge them, you then suddenly have to, I don't know, sort it or do some work with it. Here, it's all done for you. The next new thing is uh, on this stream compression. Uh, I, I don't think it's worth talking <laughs> too much about this subject. I mean, it's very useful, very good, um, but it's pretty technical. The, the point being the value out of it is that you can save some disk space because we see more and more users that have like terabytes of data on streams. And if they would like have to NAS to handle the compression, they, they, they will be able into 10, um, and there will be zip and uh, still, which are different needs, uh, different, different feature set. There are also a few smaller things. Uh, the stream and consumer metadata, there was something uh, from f that when you use streams and consumers, you had to put all the information you want about it in the name and in the description. It was not very clean. Now you have the metadata, which is basically hash map, uh, so key value map, but you can put some metadata information. It's useful for Kubernetes uh, situations or for versioning or for whatever else thing. Uh, some multiple CA, STP uh, support, republish edits, and UTC-based logs, and nothing to talk uh, longer about. Mm, yeah, and that's basically what we have for 2.10. The 2.10 is not yet released. Uh, it's, we just released 2.9.16, which is uh, uh, the, the last release of 2.9. Uh, and the next one will be 2.10, which we don't have concrete uh, date yet, but it's, it's, it's soon. <laughs> it's soon, it's probably somewhere next month coming in. You want oh, to come it? on. <laughs> Okay, so we would like to give you some time to 
ask all the questions, have some open discussions. We, we, when you're done with time, just reach us out. We're here. There's also folks from, from Senadia working on us back yeah. in there. Uh, wave the hands, guys. Yeah, Senadia. Uh, so, so we are pretty distributed and, and scaled here. Uh, you, you can reach any of us and ask questions. But yeah, here we have time to just have a question that can be answered for everybody. Ah, no questions. Thank you, Adam. You have a question? I've got a question. Yeah, uh, no, I was just joking. Uh. You don't. <laughs> I've got a serious question, though. Compression. So with it turned on, what are we saving on disk? Sorry? With the compression, yeah. 210. Have we got some test results in terms of what we're going to save? Uh, well, it, de <laughs> it depends. Uh -huh. <laughs> It depends, but it's typical for, for what you do with compression. If you have a lot of the payloads are JSON with repeated fields, a typical compression scenario, it will act, it will act according to like S2 or zip compression. Okay. So it will save you, but actually that's a good question, meaning because usually the payloads are JSON, which are repeated fields over and over and over again, and then it's doing good job. Very not concrete answer, but. It'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. Uh, going back on the active passive question, if we have active passive clusters serving just stream with persistency, is there a way to sync the persistent layer and the state between the active passive? Yes, stream? you can do sourcing and mirrors, uh, which will uh, asynchronously um, source one stream from one side to the other side. Uh, asynchronous, it does not mean like it's a minutes or seconds be, uh, uh, behind. It, Basically, it's the, the lack, the latency behind the, the clusters, and we'll make sure that all the data is properly synced. Uh, and we even use this feature actually to, to, to we can make uh, the mm, round trips shorter because you can, for example, you have a globally dis distributed system and all over the world, and the, 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 the stream is like in Europe and you're reading in US. You can make a mirror from the Europe to US. So of course the data has to go uh, uh, through, the, through the ocean, but when it's there, everybody who is fetching the data having uh, very close access to it. So it's the streams and mirrors have many use cases, and one of this is this that you can, mm, yeah, move the data, not move, not, not move the data, replicate the data elsewhere. And the difference is that sources allow you to source many streams into one. So this was the example I showed you that you, for example, source. Each factory, oh, to take this example, have set of um, streams on themselves, so they can persist the data without connectivity to the uh, to the main cluster. But and the, when the link is up, uh, the stream will automatically NATS will automatically synchronize the state. And one question, thank you. One question about the globally distributed clusters. I guess we have uh, different clusters with different brains eventually hosted on different Kubernetes clusters. And how do we make the leaf connect to both? Or you use a load balancer in front, or just uh, DNS uh, load balancing? There, there, like that? there are two uh, patterns to, uh, to, to think about it. One is a super cluster. So you connect many clusters via gateways into one very big super cluster. And this is one way. And the other way is leaf nodes, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, when you can create some hub and spoke or hub and spoke and hub and spoke because you can extend it how far you like it uh, until you're lost in, <laughs> in the topology. Um, and this is different, little different use case. Uh, li works a little differently, but it's kind of new ones when you want to choose which. Usually when the connectivity is very good, you're happy with the big super cluster because it's seamless to use and work with. Uh, we, we, when it's leaf nodes, you, you need to consciously say what is available where, in what accounts, etc., what permissions. But both are can apply here and uh, and fix the problem on the global scale. Quite often, it's like super cluster, a central one, uh, like uh, span across like free uh, data centers, for example, or free cloud providers even. So it's cloud agnostic, and that is often useful that because that is pretty good at because you can create a super clusters. You, you can be really easily cloud agnostic and, or, or span across clusters across many uh, cloud providers. But then, if there are devices with, with a little more susceptible to the outages, link down, et cetera, then you use leaf nodes so they will synchronize when they are up and they're not interrupting any work when they're down. So a little more nuance, I gave you like a <laughs> Thank you. over, yeah. 
can I just add something right on to the end of that really, really good answer? Um, what I'm noticing a lot is we're kind of seeing old enterprise designs meet head on with Kubernetes. So NATS is really good at being NATS. So if we throw a leaf node at a cluster, we can give uh, leaf nodes and clients multiple connections and the clients will try and reconnect. They will try and do the right thing. So if you can steer the logic either in, in business code, uh, in bus steer the connection logic in business logic or through credential logic, you can actually, you'll, you, you can take the load balancers out. You can let NATS distribute things across queue groups as well. So it's not I'm saying like, you know, the old ways are dead. It's just that NATS is good at being NATS. And the second we kind of put things in the middle, you're then kind of tipping the, the scales in different ways. And what's important, you don't have to pull all, all the addresses of all the servers and clusters in uh, because the NAT server has the gossip protocol. It will gossip to the clients all available uh, servers. And when you try to reconnect, it will just try to find one it works. Uh, so we don't have to handle also not this. Yeah. Any, Any more questions? <laughs> Here you go. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a uh, single NAT server running outside of uh, Kubernetes, and I have a workload running inside of Kubernetes. I want to move NATs inside Kubernetes as well in a clustered way. And um, should I consider the currently running server as the cluster and spawn the new cluster as leave nodes, or the other way around? When I want to keep all the messages and move my workload to the new cluster inside per, uh, Kubernetes gradually. You, <laughs> you can do both. Uh, and again, it kind of depends uh, on the, because NATs can be very performant and very quick in responses and low latencies. And I would say that this would be should, what should drive uh, your approach because uh, you would lose a lot if you increase the latency being here or there. So usually the answer is just see what's more performant and working better, which usually means closer to the client and also when you form a cluster, it's close to each other. So you know the raft consensus work quickly and swiftly. And based on that, I would uh, move forward. Okay, and if, if latency is not that big of an issue because all the servers are running inside the same VPC mm -hmm. yeah, that's, of that's, AWS? Th that's fine. I think that's one of the greatest things is how NATS is flexible. Though it also sometimes is a challenge that you need a little more input, you know, just a short discussion to find the, the, the best possible approach. Okay, thanks. There is, um, uh, as always, it depends. I was expecting him to say, well, it depends. So I was like, <laughs> oh, and he didn't do it. It's such a disappointment. Um, if you're considering splitting, say, a cluster and you, you're going to take it down to Kubernetes, try and think of NATS as requiring a normalized environment. So if you're going to run a cluster, you've got to kind of think same CPU, same RAM, same disk mm -hmm. to get that normalized experience. Think of it as a, as a pipeline. Less surprises. Less surprises. <coughs> and, and, you know, we've seen all sorts of weird things. But um, the common pattern at the minute is to put the leaf node in the, in the pod, let things talk east to us, let that call outbound. Mm -hmm. we, we can talk. I mean, you know, we're on Slack. You can find us. Here. It always <laughs> depends. Yeah, here. We're always here. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you. Got it. Good question. And there. <laughs> and we, there. Have, we have we, last minute, last question. Oh, it is a challenge. <laughs> Throw it. I'll <laughs> <laughs> Throw it. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, we are currently playing around a little bit with NUTs and especially with NUTs superclusters. And uh, we have very dynamic environments where we spin clusters up and down or Kubernetes clusters. Um, for the superclusters, would that be that um, would you rather put a NATS cluster in each Kubernetes cluster that comes up and can connect to other nodes in a supercluster, or are superclusters more a static thing and you would work around that with leaf nodes or something like that? This Good question. Uh, I think that the staticness is more around persistence layer because if you have persistence layer, uh, the data in NATS is stored on specific nodes and you can, of course, uh, make an HA out of it with replicas, etc. But this setup, it will not automatically move to the other nodes, to the other clusters on itself, because it can be very expensive, like it's one terabyte <laughs> of data. Uh, but when it's, uh, again, it depends. <laughs> uh, but, but usually the, the reason, if you want to have one big cluster or smaller super clusters, because I guess this is kind of the point, is if the, again, latencies. Because super clusters is not sensitive to bigger latencies because it does not have to propagate the, uh, the, the raft consensus across the whole world, and it's, it, it localizes the latency. So if your latency around your whole ecosystem is good, then you can just use one cluster span across many things. 
if it's not that good, then you probably localize, yeah, in here, this region is good latency, so I'll put cluster here and cluster there, and just don't allow bigger latencies to be in one cluster because that will slow down the whole system, right? Did I answer? Thanks. I think you I have to process it a bit. But <laughs> <laughs> it's a really fancy way of saying it depends. <laughs> <laughs> always. Always. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Thank we you. We are unfortunately out Brilliant. of time. Cheers.